Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar. I'm Nancy Fellinger, a member of the team of financial planners here at Sensible Money. We're one of the very few planning and investment firms that specialize in retirement accumulation. And for us, everything starts with a plan, and that includes planning for how to deal with the unexpected. Tonight, founder and CEO Dana Ansbach will be talking about planning for disruptions. She's the author of one of the most respected guidebooks for consumers and financial professionals alike, Control Your Retirement Destiny, which is now available as a podcast. And she will be heading to Virginia shortly to film a lecture series for the online educational platform, The Great Courses, aptly titled How to Plan the Perfect Retirement, and with an anticipated uh, release date of early next year. I'm in Pauley's Island, South Carolina tonight, and Dana's in Scottsdale, Arizona. We also have Sensible Money team members in other states as well, and we work with clients all across the country using the same technology that we're using for this webinar. You can add any questions to the chat box as we go, and we'll have plenty of time at the end for all of them. This webinar is being recorded, and we'll follow up with a link to it within the next several days, along with a copy of tonight's presentation. So with that, let's turn it over to Dana to get started. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. Well, I want to talk tonight about planning for disruptions, but I want to start with something I came across a few months ago called the happiness equation. And it's a little different, um, but if you think about what makes you happy in life, it's kind of an interesting answer. And what it comes down to, at least according to some people's uh, ideas, is that happiness is when your perception of the events in your life are greater than your expectations. And when we think about this, it kind of made me giggle a little bit the first time I thought it, but it was related to investments, but really in all things in life. If something exceeds our expectations, we feel happy. And if we thought things were going to turn out one way, but they didn't turn out that way at all, we feel exceedingly disappointed. And, and sometimes that turns into unhappiness. I want to translate this into some things that we often have perceptions about and those perceptions don't work out the way we thought. And the first is just taking how we think about investments and saving for retirement. And this is looking at somebody age 25 all the way to age 65, so 40 year time period, and assuming they invest 5,000 per year. If only we could get every 25 year old to invest $5,000 a year for life. We wouldn't have a retirement problem on our hands here, here in our country. Well, over the particular 40 years from 1980, basically through the end of 2019, the S&P actually averaged 10%. So it was what's called an annualized average return. Of course, it didn't earn 10% every year, but when you look at the cumulative result, the average return uh, was 10% a year. And so these red bars represent what we picture when we mentally hear an average of 10% a year. And we may not picture it. You know, an image may not show up in our mind, but we have this perception, this idea that our investments are going to grow at this nice and steady pace or that we're going to start saving for retirement. It's going to occur in this linear fashion. And you notice I have one of the years highlighted. It's the year 2006. So partway through this 40-year period, uh, more than halfway through, uh, you had $666,000. And of course, if things worked the way that we pictured in our head, that $5,000 a year grew to about two and a half million. And, and that sounds great if we could convince young people to save in the first place and if they could save consistently and if everything could earn 10% a year, this is, this is what would happen. But here's reality. The S&P did average, have an average annual return of 10% a year but these blue bars represent that it went up and then it went down and then it went up and then it went down and then it went up and then it went down. And here's that same year, 2006. Actually, 2006, we didn't have as much in, in our reality picture as, as we had pictured in our mind. And at the end of that full 20 years, we had just under 1.6 million. So we got to about one and a half million instead of two and a half million. So it's a pretty big difference. And how could that be? First of all, if we were at 2006, we were pretty close to the same place. 
Well, what really happened is from 1980 through 2006, the S&P averaged 11% a year, but then from 2007 through the end of 2019, it averaged 8% a year. And so the cumulative impact was a little different. But this in itself shows more volatility, but it still doesn't capture what reality is actually like. So it doesn't show us the extent of the volatility that we actually experience. So here we dig even a little deeper. This is 1980 and in, in the first bar, and the second bar is 1981 and, and so on, all the way up to the first calendar quarter of 2020. And the gray bar shows you what the S&P 500 did for that year. So in 1980, it was up 26%. The red dot, however, shows you that what we call intra-year decline. Meaning if you were looking partway through the year, there was a point in time where the S&P was down 17%. But yet it finished the year up 26. And notice almost every single one of these years has a, a red dot. And this particular year that we're in 2020 right now, uh, in March, we were down 34% and has since recovered substantially from then, quite faster than I think any of us expected. But if you think about your perception of how investments grow or how wealth grows over time, this reality, I think, is often far different than, than what we perceive. I'm not sure why, but it is. And, and so we could have better outcomes just by understanding that uh, the path that we get there can be a really bumpy ride. But this particular difference between perception and reality isn't just about investments. We can also look at income. So for those of you who are still working and or who have children who are unemployed or you know struggling at this time, and a lot of us know people who are going through some struggles or furloughed or or out of work right now. Well, take somebody, perhaps an engineer that's expecting to start out making about 44,000 a year. And over here, they expect it will increase by about 5% a year. And so here we see about 17 years worth of kind of what they envision. They're gonna get start out getting their first job and every year they're gonna make a little bit more than the year before. And over time, you know, their, their income's gonna grow quite a bit. Well, here, is an actual social security statement for someone that started off earning 44,000 a year. And the next year, their income went down. And the year after that, they were unemployed for part of the year. So their income was down substantially. And then it went up and they exceeded what they thought they would make. And then it went down. And then they got a raise. Maybe they moved into management and had a couple of really good years. And then they went through a period of unemployment again. And, and their income dropped substantially. And so when we think about what they thought was gonna happen over here on the left and what actually happened, again, it's a very different path. In this first 10 years of their working history, uh, five of those years, they made less than what they expected. And in the next three years or next um, seven years, three of those years, they made less than what they expected. Now there were some years where they made substantially more and overall they, they did quite a bit better than what they had, had expected. But if we always expect this forward linear progress, we don't plan for these kinds of disruptions. And there's one additional thing I wanted to show you. This is a, an actual excerpt from a social security statement. You'll notice there's two columns and you can go grab your social security statement and look if you care to. You have your social security tax earnings and then you have your Medicare tax earnings. And in this particular case, you see there's years where there's a difference. And so that means that this person hit the Social Security wage base. So this was the maximum amount of their income that was subject to Social Security withholding, but they had additional income that was still subject to Medicare earnings. And I think it can be kind of interesting to pull your own Social Security statement and look and see what that path looks like. I have seen very few that have a nice, smooth increase year after year. Most of them, you'll see quite a, quite a bit of disruptions. So when you think through all of that, and given that disruptions are normal, what's the number one thing we could do to plan for them? We could expect them. Of course, if we expected disruptions, I think we would all be better at planning for them. And in some ways, I feel like I should just end the webinar there. There you have it, that's what we should do. But we know human nature doesn't work that way, right? 
we 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 don't seem to plan as well as we should for these disruptions. So I want to go through five concrete things that we can do to help us better plan for disruptions. And some of these things are going to include things you can share if you need them yourself or with family members who may be going through a disruption right now. The first thing is having a spending plan. And I don't like the word budget. I never have. Uh, some of you who have listen to my podcast or, or read some of my work know that I tell this story about my first or second year in college and my dad made me do a budget and I was so mad and uh, he I went through my checkbook back when that was the primary way we paid for everything and used highlighters and color coded everything into eight categories and gosh that exercise has served me well for the rest of my life. So now I have always kept not a budget, but a, a spending plan, an idea of, in general, um, what's my bare bones budget? That's how I like to think of it. If I lose my job and, and I own my business, so it would be difficult for me to lose my job. But you never know what, what could happen, right? Life can throw some crazy things at any of us far outside of the realm of what we might think could happen. And, and we've all seen that now in the last few months. So I'm going to share with you my own actual bare bones spending plan. It's very simple. Um, I have a mortgage. I have a water payment, electric, internet, my auto insurance, which includes uh, Harley Davidson Softail Slim and two dirt bikes. And I have a thousand dollar line item for what I call necessities, gas, food, medical out of pocket, required home or car repairs. So if I have to cut my income or live off of a bare bones budget because I need to save more or because of I, had, I have a disruption in income, which I have experienced many, many times in my career, then I know I would need $4,200 a month. I would need to have enough saved to cover that level of expenses for, for a period of time. Now, notice there's two things not on my bare bones budget. It's a cell phone and it's health insurance because those are paid through my business right now. Uh, and if the business were to somehow go away, of course, I would need to cover those expenses. And so when I had the 4200 up to the 600 I have about a $4,800 bare bones budget. This is if I wasn't willing to sell my house or uh, sell my car or sell anything else. And we'll talk about those things to raise cash. And I think it's important to always have your bare bones budget, to always know, you know, what is the minimum? that it would take to cover your household expenses. And it doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to involve tracking every single place that, that money goes. What I do when it comes to this necessities category is everything goes on a credit card and that gets paid off every month. And I just look at the, the top line number. You know, what was what was the bill for the month? And it has to stay within a specific range. And I've had times where I had to keep it under a thousand, well under a thousand dollars a month. And the only thing that, that I could spend was gas and groceries uh, because I went through time, particularly when I moved here to Arizona, where I made almost no money at all. And uh, it was very challenging. And so for those of us who have been through those challenges, we learn to kind of think in this worst case scenario. Uh, and this is an even worse case. So. If I think through worst case, what if something really bad happened and and I have disability insurance, but um, you know something bad happened to the business or, or the country or, or my own health? Well, I could always sell the house and that would reduce one of my biggest expenses and I could go rent and I could probably rent a place that, that would be okay, acceptable for me for somewhere under $1,000 a month. And I could always downsize my car and I could save a little bit on insurance. And there's a few other things, and I figure I could probably get this number down uh, e even lower, at least down by another thousand, maybe even $2,000 a month, um, actually a little bit more than that if I had to. And I think that way because I've been through so many disruptions of my own. And of course, I, I do retirement planning for a living as we all do here at Sensible Money. And we need to think through worst case scenarios and, and always know what that is. So if you're going through an income disruption or if you have children or grandchildren, one of the most valuable skills you can teach them is how to make their bare bones budget and, and how to think through the kinds of trade-offs that they could use to get through some of the disruptions that they will experience. And of course, make sure they know that they will experience them. 
Now, part of the spending plan is exploring trade-offs. And as I was doing some research, I just happened to come across this comparison between a BMW and a, and a Hyundai, which in my mind um, wouldn't be all that comparable. Yet, when you look at the, the ratings, and this is from 2017, you'll see that the Hyundai ranks quite highly. Um, but the pricing is, again, not as different as I would have thought. You have the MSRP pricing for the BMW at just over 33,000 versus uh, just under 22 for the Hyundai. But the average paid still isn't all that great. But if I were to spend a lifetime driving Hyundais or at least starting off my career that way, uh, you could save quite a bit of money. And I only bring this up because sometimes well, actually, often one of the biggest mistakes I see people make when they go through a disruption is they refuse to change their lifestyle or certain things about their lifestyle. They refuse to consider driving uh, what they might consider a, a less uh, superior car, or they refuse to consider downsizing. And although we often talk about the Starbucks factor, and you know, if you just you know, made coffee at home. The reality is some of the first things to tackle when you go through a disruption are, are your bigger ticket items. And I remember working with someone once who had a substantial decrease in income, and yet um, they insisted on their $1,400 a month car payment. I can't remember what it was that they drove. Um, but that was something that, that to them, they just would not consider changing that. And yet there are things that are very comparable that could offer maybe some of the same benefits and the same feeling. It just might not have the brand name. And I think people have to be willing to think through those trade-offs. And I've had to think through those trade-offs. So I mentioned I went through a really tough time uh, moving here and living here when I moved in Arizona. And, you know, I thought I, I had a job that was going to turn out a certain way and it didn't. And so I had bought a brand new, the only new car I've ever bought in my lifetime. It was a brand new yellow Xterra. And I loved that car. I had lived in Colorado and, um, you know, used to do a lot of off-road and outdoor things and it was sporty and uh, I couldn't afford it. And so my job didn't work out the way I thought. And I realized I had to get back on track. I had had actually accumulated almost $25,000 in credit card debt and not from reckless spending, just from, you know, figuring out how to pay rent and groceries and, and buy my necessities. And so I went and found a used, this is a Toyota Matrix. I called it my roller skate. It was a stick shift. Luckily, I knew how to drive a stick. And I drove that car until it was paid off and saved up enough money to buy my next car with cash. And I hated that roller skate. I'll tell you that. I didn't, didn't like it. But it had a hatchback. It had room for my dog. I could still put a bicycle. I did a lot of cycling then. I could still do the things that I wanted to do. It got great gas mileage, and it was much more affordable than my Xterra. And I was willing to make that trade-off, and I know it's hard, and, and I just see too many people today who aren't willing to do that. Now, today, that has evolved, and just for fun, uh, I thought I'd share with you my car, which I did have wrapped um, in sensible money oranges, and uh, I'm not quite sure what I think about that. Uh, it does make you very visible if you accidentally uh, go through a, a red light when you're not supposed to, which I did once, Yeah, but it's a lot of fun. And uh, I thought if I'm going to drive something nicer, I wanted to also use it to market the business. But I got there because I was willing to make those kinds of trade-offs. There's one thing I didn't do that I wish I would have when I went through some tough times of my own, and that is using social safety nets. So I've been through times where my income was non-existent, where I probably could have filed for unemployment, and it never crossed my mind. And uh, probably that's a good thing. I've been self-employed and it was always something I had to figure out. But I have encountered people today who seem to have a stigma. I know we read in the news about the people who are collecting it instead of going back to work, but I've also seen the opposite. I've seen people who could really use some of the social safety nets, but they refuse to. And instead, they do spend down their own assets, you know, use their own savings because they just have a, in their mind a stigma against using unemployment benefits. So while I don't recommend using them recklessly for people who lose their job and, and legitimately qualify, I think you have to be open. And if you have children or grandchildren in, in that situation, that's what it's there for. It really is there for these times where it's, it's supposed to be a social safety net.
for people who need it, I'm, I'm a fan of using it. So number two, when we think about disruptions, you've probably heard the saying of, about money burning a hole in our pocket. Why don't we hold more cash? Like as a society, why don't we? I know one of the things that we saw after 2008, 2009 was people holding more cash. And I do think that that trend continued, which is great. But as the economy did better and as things got more stable, and of course, interest rates being as low as they are, more and more people didn't want to hold cash. They wanted to find, you know, where can I put my money to earn more money? And we'll often, you'll hear those of us here at Sensible Money say the price of safety is a low return. And we think of that as a cost, but there's a benefit to holding cash. And when we go through these disruptions, I think that benefit becomes very prevalent. And it, there's a mental benefit. It brings us peace of mind. It's like insurance. So instead of paying an insurance premium, think about holding cash and you may not earn a lot of interest on it, but it is a form of insurance so that when these disruptions happen, you have something to turn to. And I also like to think of it instead of, you know, we think of an emergency fund, think of cash as an opportunity fund. So if you had cash at the bottom of these market volatility, these, these extreme events that happen, it's a great time to put cash to work. And we did have several people reach out to us actually wanting to put cash to work, which was great. Um, you know, sometimes on the same day, we would have someone else reaching out to us scared that thinking that they should exit out of the market and go to cash. So on the same day, we can hear from people who, who view it both ways. But overall, we know holding more cash brings security, but we don't do it. We don't hold as much cash as we should. And instead, what happens is people start to tap into their retirement accounts when disruptions happen. I'm going to explain why I prefer people avoid that. But first, a quick question for you guys. Which one of the things on the screen is not like the other? I see a lot of mutual fund answers coming in, a lot of them. Fantastic, you are correct. So here's the, the main thing. A 401k and an IRA are accounts. They're not investments. Mutual funds can be held inside of an IRA or a 401k or outside. And there's very different tax consequences to doing it one way or the other. But believe it or not, I encounter a lot of people who think of an IRA as an investment. And well, one of the common questions I've gotten is, you know, well, what does what do IRAs pay as if they were they were a CD? And so if that's you, um, you know, that's a, it's a common question that people aren't in the financial world that they don't know. But mutual funds are investments. They go inside of IRAs or 401ks. There are certain creditor protections that is applied to your retirement account assets like 401ks, IRAs, 403bs, and other types of retirement accounts. So again, my job is always to think worst case, let's say you or your spouse, or, or, or if you're single, you lose your job. And we often see this you know, for people later in life who aren't able to replace the income level or the previous level that they reached. And so what do you do? Well, of course, we would encourage you if you're eligible to file for unemployment, but do you tap into your 401k and IRA assets? Well, in a worst case scenario where you were unemployed for a really long period of time and ended up having to file bankruptcy, those 401k and IRA assets are protected. Matter of fact, currently, um, 401ks under federal law, I believe, have an unlimited amount of protection. And your combination of traditional and Roth IRAs, the, the current limit of protection is one, just over 1.3 million. And it's indexed to inflation. So every three years, they ratchet that number up. And uh, if you roll over a 401k to an IRA and do it properly, then um, the, that can also be protected under the 401k laws. So again, when I think through a worst case scenario, I've seen people cash in 401ks to keep their house. I saw this in 2008, 2009. And if it gets worse, they end up truly with, with nothing. Whereas in a situation where you could file bankruptcy, you would at least come out of that and still have your retirement accounts and a nest egg that you could, could begin to rebuild. And so I think it's important that you're aware of that. So if it's not retirement account assets, then what are some of the things that you could look at using if you had a cash emergency? Well, 
Uh, home equity, I think having a, a ready to go home equity line of credit, or if you're over age 62, there's something called a reverse mortgage home equity line of credit that can give you some place where you can access cash quickly if you need to in an emergency. And the advantage to that over selling investments is oftentimes these emergencies coincide with big market downturns. You don't want to be selling your, your growth investments during market downturns. So if you have something else that you could use and and then you know when the market recovers, then maybe you sell those investments and, and pay off the home equity line of credit that you use. Some people have cash value inside life insurance policies and they forget that they might be able to withdraw or borrow some of that. Mutual funds owned outside of the 401k or IRA, we looked at that. Um, those can be something. The other thing I think people forget about are their household items. So collectibles. Uh, I mentioned in my case, I you know I own a Harley. I own two dirt bikes. I could always sell those, and I would if I needed to. Um, because you know what? When things get better, you can rebuy those things. You can get those types of things back. Uh, but in the meantime, I think in most cases it's better to try to pay cash and and not come out of a, a situation in even more debt. And so I'm a big fan of, you know, raising that money where you can. And then as a last resort, I have tapping those retirement accounts. A 401k loan uh, is an option. And they have, with the CARES Act for right now, they have increased the amount you can borrow from a maximum of either, it's either half of your vested account balance. And usually it's a cap of a max loan of 50,000. Right now it's 100,000. And they've also enacted a special provision that allows you to take money out of your retirement accounts up to $100,000 and they'll waive the 10% penalty tax. So if, if you would be subject to that, it'll be waived. And you would actually have three years to put that money back in. The difference alone, you're going to pay interest on and it's through your employer plan and you're going to have to make payments through payroll. One of the things I... I always tell people to be cautious about with a 401k loan is if you should lose that job and roll that 401k plan over, the 401k loan becomes a, usually becomes a, a taxable distribution at that time unless it's fully repaid. The CARES Act doesn't work that way. It is a distribution. It's not a loan, but you have the right to put that money back in, which is kind of cool. But again, I think of that as a last resort because any money that comes out of these accounts, you've now taken out of that creditor protection wrapper that it's inside of. So another thing to look at when you go through disruptions is tax planning. And I think of money we pay to the government that we don't have to as money down the drain. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes it does take a lot of planning to recognize tax opportunities, but those can often show up when you go through a time of unemployment. They can also show up as you transition into retirement. So this particular scenario we're looking at shows somebody, it doesn't show their age, but they are in their early 60s. And you see this last year of work where their income is 155000 and then three years where they will have almost no taxable income, and then they're going to start taking money out of their IRA. But this could just as well reflect somebody who went through a period of unemployment. And one of the things I want you to notice is this taxable income, all of their sources of income are, be running, are running through a tax calculator. And you get their taxable income, their top marginal rate, their effective rate, and their capital gains tax rate. But notice in this year, they have negative taxable income. That means that they have more deductions, or just assuming a standard deduction. And, and so there literally can be negative taxable income, which does you no good. So in that year, they could easily have converted $20,000 to a Roth IRA and when you convert money from a regular IRA to a, a Roth IRA, let's say you converted 20,000, that would add an additional 20,000 of taxable income that year and basically net this taxable income out to zero because they, they would still have all of the deductions to offset it. And, and so we look at these types of years as opportunities. And in 2008, 2009, we had 
several clients who were unemployed for quite some time, and we did a lot of Roth conversions during that time to take advantage of those negative taxable, negative taxable income years. We also find that we do that during the transition years. So uh, they've now extended the, the required minimum distributions to, you know, it used to be age 70, you had to start now at 72. And so we have this window of time, let's say someone retires at 65, so between 65 and 72, where often someone is in a much lower tax rate than what they will be in once those required distributions begin. And so these are the types of opportunities we look for. So when you go through disruptions, if it's an income disruption or even retirement can be a disruption, there are often opportunities. The other thing I want you to notice is this estimated capital gains tax rate goes from 15% to 0%. And people will often ask me, what do you mean 0% tax rate? Well, let me show you, there actually is a 0% tax rate. So here's your normal income taxes, earned income, interest income, um, non-qualified dividends, every pension income, IRA withdrawals, it all flows into what we call your adjusted gross income, and then you get your deductions against that, and what's left over is taxable, and it flows into this chart. So if you're single, you're looking at the left-hand side. If you're married, you're looking at the right-hand side. Uh, we'll look at this married column. The first 19750 is taxed at 10%, and then all the dollars that fall into this next range are taxed at 12, and then the next range at 22, and, and so on. So we don't see any 0% rate here, but there's actually a separate tax rate that applies to qualified dividends and long-term capital gains. So QD stands for qualified dividends and we're abbreviating LT for long-term capital gains. So here, if you're single and your income is zero to 40,000, any capital gains that are in that range will actually be taxed at the 0% rate so let's say you had $20,000 of earned income and you were able to sell an investment that you'd had for a long time and it generated $20,000 of capital gains. That $20,000 of capital gains would be taxed at zero. As the combination of the two starts to increase over 40,000, it moves you out of that 0% tax rate and some of those capital gains would get pushed up into the 15% tax rate. For marrieds, it's $80,000. So if your baseline income is 80,000 or less, that's a combination of your taxable income plus the capital gains. Uh, it has to be 80,000 or under, then those capital gains are taxed at zero. And as it starts to, to creep up over that, it will push those capital gains up into the, the next level. But we've seen many opportunities for retirees between the ages of 55 and 70, where there are ways to structure where their income comes from. So, you know, if you took $100,000 out of a savings account, that doesn't show up on your tax return at all. But if you took $100,000 out of your IRA, that's $100,000 that shows up on your tax return. And so there are ways to structure where your income comes from in some ways, very strategically to say, if we can create a year where we can realize some of your capital gains at zero, then in the long run, that can save you a lot of money. And so again, that's one of those tax planning opportunities that can and does show up in the middle of disruptions. Another thing you can do to plan for disruptions is layer in guaranteed income. And here I use this, this safety net concept. You know, most of us wouldn't walk on a tightrope or be in a very dangerous high, high altitude place without some type of safety net in place. And when we think about retirement income, guaranteed income, Social Security is a good example. And we'll talk about annuities, which often have a bad rap, but they do have their place for, for retirement. And they fulfill a very important function. They provide guaranteed income or a safety net. So let's look at one way that you might figure that out. This is a, a sample expense timeline for a couple named Bart and Mary, fictitious couple. And here we have all of their expenses laid out. We'll make that a little bigger. We have their mortgage. We'll see that over there. Uh, we separate out the mortgage from taxes and insurance. So the mortgage is fixed and will be paid off, but taxes and insurance are likely to go up each year with inflation. So you see those numbers rising. There's home upkeep and repairs and a baseline of living expenses, vacations, health insurance premiums, out-of-pocket medical, they have no taxes in these three years because they have savings 
after-tax savings that they're able to use. But out here, uh, you'll see their, their federal taxes start, start popping up. Now, in reality, we wouldn't allow this to happen. We wouldn't allow three years of no taxes. It actually wouldn't make sense because we would want to fill up a certain tax bracket. But this expense timeline is just designed to give you their outgoing expense items. And then we have their income. And so they have no income for a few years. And then Mary will have a partial year of Social Security. And then they will have a pension that will come in. And we start to see out here at 70, Bart's will take his own Social Security. That's a whole nother discussion about why they're following this strategy. But basically, it gets them this large amount of guaranteed income out here. So once they're both over the age 70, uh, they will have over $90,000 a year of guaranteed income. That's that type of safety net that we're talking about that could be very important to them. Well, if you wanna look at a way to quantify that safety net here, we put those numbers together. So we call this their gap timeline, the difference between their total outgoing expenses and their fixed income, meaning income not coming from their portfolio. And so in the red, we see all of the outgoing, and in the blue, we see uh, what we call the gap. And if you look at out here at their age, basically 70, the difference, if we, if we look at their total outgoing expenses in red, what you want to look at is go how much of that is covered by the green number. We call that a coverage ratio. And in their case, in 2031, it's actually 67%. So of their $140,000, which includes taxes, 92,000 or 67% of their outgoing expenses will be covered by guaranteed income, which is great. We typically will recommend this number be at 50% or higher. And um, if someone is incredibly what we call overfunded, meaning they have a lot of wealth relative to the amount of, of their spending, then it doesn't need to be quite that high. But we often tell people, do a gut check. If 50% if of your expenses aren't covered by guaranteed income, then that might be the time to look at buying an annuity, to saying, do you want an extra safety net in there? Most people will say, eh, they, there's this, this um, stigma against annuities. All it is is you're buying guaranteed income. It's an insurance product. So we have insurance on most things in our life, our house, our automobiles. We carry health insurance. Usually we have life insurance. So it's simply a way of insuring our retirement income for as long as we live. In particular, we're talking about a type of annuity called an immediate annuity. We don't sell annuities. We don't earn commissions from annuities. We just think that sometimes people overlook this tool. And if you're looking for a way to provide safety in, in the midst of future disruptions, it can be a really good tool. This is a quote off a, a website called immediateannuities.com, where we looked at a female age 66, and if she invested $100,000, she would have $479 a month for life. There's also a new website called blueprintincome.com that has great annuity quotes and, and awesome tools. I was really impressed with, with what they're doing. So if it's something you want to look at, we would, would recommend visiting that. And I ran a second quote just to show you. This was a, a couple, a male age 67 and a female age 65. And if they had put in 100,000 at these ages, it would pay them 425 for life. And I want to talk about that number for a minute. Actually, I want to back up one slide and I'll use this number. $4.79 a month, is that good? Is that bad? Oftentimes you will see annuities frame things in terms of what's called a payout rate. So if I took this $4.79 times 12, that's $5,748 a year, divided by 100,000, it's a 5.7% payout rate. A payout rate. If you were to compare that to a CD rate, you go, wow, that's great. It's not the same. So it's not an interest rate. Um, it's not a yield, like a dividend yield. Uh, it's just simply a way of calculating. It's, it's kind of a simple calculation. To actually look at what the return on the annuity is, you would have to know the time frame over which it was going to pay out. So if I took $100,000 starting value and paid out $479 a, year, a month, for 30 years, 
and assumed there was nothing left at the end of that 30 years. That's equivalent to what's called an internal rate of return of 4%. So that gives you kind of a comparison there in terms of, of a safe investment of, of how you might look at that. And while it does is, is provide that safety net, it provides income you can't, can't outlive. Where I've seen that type of thing become valuable is particularly when cognitive decline sets in or if one spouse is the financial person and the other spouse is, is much less sophisticated when that first spouse passes away, um, I, we have seen cases where the the surviving spouse might get Alzheimer's or or you know get scammed, and suddenly they're left with no assets. And if you have this guaranteed income in place, you have now at least locked in a, a minimum level of income for someone that protects them from from those types of situations. Then the last thing I want to talk about when we think about planning for disruptions is how we manage our reactions. So I forgot about this saying. The other day I was talking with a neighbor and we were talking about housing prices and he's like, well, there's only two days when the price matters, the day you buy it and the day you sell it. And um, it's true. And it's also true with our investments. And yet we get so caught up in the news and the media and when this particular crisis started you know a lot of headlines and still some headlines saying it was or is going to be worse than the great depression and all of these emotions start and i have never seen good investment decisions based on extreme emotions on either side uh, extreme greed uh, or hope or excitement uh, I saw someone lose four million dollars once getting scammed because that was the emotion that that the person perpetrating the fraud was able to create and and so they didn't do any due diligence um, and extreme fear doesn't lead to good investment decisions either so our definition of success as a firm I, I laid this out for everybody when this crisis started was that we didn't have any clients abandon their plan. And so far we have a hundred percent success rate in that. We're very excited. Um, we definitely had a few people who at, at the bottom of the market in March really thought, you know, it was gonna be worse. We didn't know. We didn't know if it'd be worse or not. We just knew that we needed to stick with the plan. And so it's our emotions that get to us. And so I would encourage everybody to think about, you know, what does the news do? Does it help or hurt your reactions when you're going through a disruption? For some people, there are people who can spot opportunities in the news, who can actually use uh, everything going on to buy when everyone else is selling, to you know spot great opportunities or, or great stocks. But I found for most people, it doesn't seem to help. And we will tell people when we're going through a crisis, at least in regards to their investments, that I bet if you turned off the news and didn't open your statements for two years and we would, could sit back down in two years, you would never know all of this happened. And that has always turned out to be the case. All of those things that we get riled up over, you know, when we look back two years, oftentimes we, we you know, don't even remember. You know, I'm sure with this crisis, uh, we will remember this will have a long lasting impact and something that we'll be dealing with for, for quite some time. But in terms of our investments in that type of volatility, um, those types of emotions don't really help or hurt our reactions. What does is having a plan, having a, you know, I think of it as, as uh, an accident plan, an emergency plan. I ride motorcycles, as many of you know, and it started with me riding dirt bikes. And it was about my 10th time on a dirt bike. I had a pretty bad accident. Um, I actually broke my wrist and got a pulmonary embolism. And, um, you know, I, I didn't really know how to ride, which is why that happened. And I was doing something that far exceeded my, my skill set. And uh, later I was talking with a friend about it and I was explaining, you know, like, I just, now that I know what, how to ride, when I was first starting, I still didn't know that, you know, what, which was the brake, what was the gas, you know, what, what do I do? It wasn't instinctive at all. And my friend was like, oh, you know, you need crash testing, you know, crash test planning. Can't remember what he called it, but he was a helicopter pilot. And of course they run them through all kinds of simulations. 
And it stuck with me. I thought, yeah, if you're going to learn to do anything like that, right, you need simulation. So you know when this situation happens, it's just like that. You know exactly what to do. And the same thing comes with your finances, with, with your investments, is when you have a plan in place, it tells you exactly what to do. And instead of these disruptions, you know, of course, they're still going to be disruptive, but instead of, you know, your whole world getting turned upside and down, you go, okay, I have a plan for this. Uh, I knew these disruptions were going to happen, and now I'm going to execute my plan, and I'm going to stick with it because that's what's going to get me through it. So those are my five tips on, on planning for disruptions. Uh, for those of you who want to learn more, I cover a very thorough retirement income planning process in my book, Control Your Retirement Destiny. And then last year, I podcasted each one of the chapters and expanded on that. That's available on Apple or on Podbean. And for those of you who would like to talk with us, we always offer a, a complimentary introductory phone uh, or web meeting. Uh, we have clients in 26 states, as Nancy said, I think, and and uh, we have many of our clients whom we've never met face to face. So when it came to working remotely and social distancing for us, it was was an easy transition. It actually wasn't wasn't a disruption to our business at all, which we're very very grateful for. I'm going to open it up for questions. Nancy is going to be my moderator, so she will typically okay. help help read through those questions. And I, you can ask me anything you want, and this is the the time for it. I love Q and A. Great. Okay. Thanks, Dana. So the first question here is uh, it's, it's, it's rather long, but um, have you read the book The Value of Debt in Retirement by Thomas Anderson and The Power of Zero by David McKnight? The approach is to convert traditional 401k or IRA into Roth, maximize the Social Security withdrawal, and the excess money goes into uh, an, an investment IUL. Uh, I think it's life a insurance. life insurance. I think, yeah. yeah. Could you explain? So, you, could you explain your approach? Thanks. Yeah. So first question, have I read the book, The Value of Debt by Thomas Anderson? Yes, I actually heard Thomas Anderson speak at a Schwab conference in, I believe it was in Denver um, in 2012 and bought his book and have recommended it to many clients. The concept is that if you're a higher net worth, which I would define as probably one to two million of net worth or more, there can be a value in holding good debt. Good debt would be like mortgage debt or there's things called pledged asset lines of credit you can borrow against um, portfolio assets that are not inside retirement accounts. And we are a fan of that those concepts in the right situation, particularly um, with mortgage rates as low as they are right now. There are many times where we think, um, you know, paying down a, a mortgage where the rate is 2.75% or 3% might not result in the in the ideal outcome in the long term. So for someone's comfortable with, with that strategy, um, investing the money and, and retaining very low interest rate, what's called good debt, can make sense. The second part of that question was the power of zero. I haven't actually read that book. Um, I am familiar with the concept. Uh, we do a lot of tax planning and are huge fans of converting appropriately tax deferred 401k IRA assets over to Roths. But we have a way of modeling it all out where there's a set of metrics that we look at to decide if that makes sense. So we look at what we call someone's fundedness level. So if we do things this way versus this way, did their overall level of security increase? And then we look at their what we call liquidation value. So at the end of their plan, do they have more wealth because of the decision or less wealth because of, of that series of decisions? And so there are metrics that we use to test different planning strategies and see if those Roth conversions actually add value to that person or not. In terms of putting all of the money in life insurance, a whole cash value life insurance policies, there are a few cases where I have seen that work. And uh, they're very, very few and far between. And so I get the concept on paper. It rarely fits someone's actual financial circumstances. That's the easiest way for me to say that. But I have seen it fit. Um, part of the problem I have with it is I, I think um, people who sell life insurance and that's all they do propose that particular strategy. They don't have any analytical way of saying, does that strategy actually fit your situation? For those of you who aren't familiar with the strategy, when you put money into a life insurance policy, if you do it correctly, 
you can access that money back out tax-free in retirement. And the power of zero would be that concept of basically paying zero taxes throughout retirement. And it is possible. And for really high income earners who don't expect a lot of income disruptions, uh, the strategy can, can work really well. But like I said, I don't see it be a good fit all of that often. Uh, next question, Dana, is do you have a minimum asset level for prospective clients? We don't have a minimum asset level. Um, we have a financial planning fee that we charge. And so for the majority of our clients, they go through a very comprehensive three strategy meeting process. And the planning fee is $6,900. Uh, for some clients, it's less if they have a very simple situation. So we walk through all of that at our complimentary introductory meetings and, and make sure that it's a good fit. Um, but no, if that if there's enough value that we can add for our pricing, then it's a good fit. And sometimes, you know, we've had people who, you know, have less assets uh, where it is still a really good value because of some complex things that they've got going on in their plan. The next question is, how do you decide if you should sell stocks for a loss since this means selling low? Ideally, rather than selling the stock, you do what's called an exchange. So you are probably asking about the concept we call it tax loss harvesting, where, you know, let's say we owned a large cap index fund and we're going to exchange it for a similar large cap index fund on the same day. So I'm not actually out of the stock market. You know, on the very same day, I sold one mutual fund and those price at the end of the day and I bought the other one. And and so but I since they're not the same identical fund, I captured that tax loss and I'll be able to use it on my tax return. But I stayed invested. So when the market goes back up, um, my investments will still recover. If it's individual stocks you're looking at, what some people will do, well, um, they'll find a very similar stock in the same industry. So they're still trading same day from one stock to the other. So they're not out of the market, but they're capturing the loss. Okay, here, here is, uh, here's one for DYI folks. How do you feel about DYI folks using funded ratios periodically to assess post-retirement finances? So if you mean the same thing I mean when we talk about funded <laughs> ratios, um, then I'm a huge fan. And so I think of it, I, I just made a copy, I'll have to use it in one of these webinars, of a client brought in their pension statement. It was for APS. If you're here in Arizona, um, that's our, our utility company. And so a pension plan each year will, will provide you the fundedness ratio of the pension plan. Well, we do the same thing for, for clients' retirement. It's a way of comparing all the future withdrawals to their current assets and saying, are they sufficiently funded? And so we look at that test every single year. We rerun a client's funded ratio just as a pension plan would. And so I'm a huge fan of it if, if, that's, if you're referring to that same term. Absolutely. Okay. And how do you approach when to refinance your house in retirement since it does cost money? Um, generally, I think the rough rule of thumb, if you follow my work, you know I'm never a fan of using rules of thumb as the final <laughs> deciding factor, but I think the rough rule of thumb is if the interest rate is 1% less or, you know, or more, but actually there are calculators you can use and you can put in your closing costs and, and all of that and, and see if refinancing will save you money. What it does is actually calculate your break-even point. So would you have to stay in the house at that new payment for how long? Five years, 10 years, three years? At what point would it actually have saved you money? And there's, I believe, many online calculators today that can help you with that. Next question, Dana. Is there a software available to run numbers on a Roth conversion? You know, all of the software I am familiar with are subscriptions-based software for financial advisors. And so it's complex because there's just there's a lot of moving parts the it's been a while honestly since i ran you know any kind of google search for roth conversion calculators the last time i had looked the stuff out there was in my opinion not great meaning it only looked at tax rates and it it completely neglected to factor in a lot of the benefits of the roth 
Roth distributions aren't included in the formula that determines how much of your Social Security is taxable. They're not included in the formula that determines how much of your Medicare Part B premiums are taxable. They're not included in the formula that determines whether you're eligible for a health care premium tax credit. I could go on and on. So there's these hidden benefits to Roth that many of the calculators, when I last looked, and it's been a few years, didn't, didn't capture. So I, I just am not aware of a good consumer tool for that. Yeah, I don't. I, I can't recall it saying anything uh, along those lines either. The next question, Dana. What are your thoughts on the fire movement? Fire movement. So the fire movement, if if someone is not familiar with it, is what's called financial independence, retire early. And there are a lot of bloggers. That, one of my favorite called I think it's Extreme Retirement by Jacob Lund that I read many many years ago. And and they this movement became famous from all these bloggers who. Basically, the idea is you live like no one else will so that you can do what no one else can do. You save an extraordinarily high percentage of your income, 50, 70, 80% for a 10 or 15 year period so that you can retire early. I think for people who want that, um, if that's their goal, I think it's fine. You know, we all have different values. I like the value of, I call it a life well worked. And so um, for me, I have to be actively engaged in something and uh, I'm lucky that I love what I do. And, and so I would rather spend more along the way and save prudently and um, work, you know, hopefully till I'm 70, but that's me. And I think the important thing is to know you. And so for people who are really willing to save a substantial portion of their income to exit the workforce at an early age, go for it. Due to the SECURE Act, child beneficiaries will be forced to withdraw within 10 years in lieu of that, put money into the whole life policy towards meeting income and also leaving to beneficiaries and also long-term care benefits. What are your thoughts? Um, so again, it's one of those things, you know, if the money's already in the IRA, and a lot of it depends on what the goal is. So. If your own retirement income needs are met, then it's a very different goal if you're looking at now, how do I structure things to get the most assets to my future generation? So we always start with making sure that your own retirement income needs are met and structuring a plan around that first. And so those in some ways are different benefits. If we're primarily looking at structuring your own retirement income needs. We're not as concerned that your beneficiaries have to take money out over 10 years. So I know that's kind of a roundabout answer. The truth is without running both scenarios side by right. side and, and understanding right. your goals, it's really hard to, to answer that. But my gut reaction is, you know, I, I certainly, I'm not opposed to any type of strategy. I just like to analyze it. You know, I like to, yeah. to actually take a look at it and, and run out, something both ways and, and then I can objectively see the pros and cons. Yep. And this question shows that there's a there's an understanding that there are there are lots of different ways to, to accomplish a goal. So yep. um, what financial planning software do you use with clients? Uh, currently we use a couple different things, but one of the modeling tools we use is called Finance Logics. And so it was purchased by uh, Investnet many, many years ago. Okay, next question, Dana. How do you plan for big ticket expenses like roof repair, uh, replacement of a car and retirement, those sorts of things? Great question. So one of the questions we ask um, when we begin working with a client is, you know, how often do you purchase cars? How do you pay for them? Do you pay cash? Do you finance them? What price point? And so let's say someone purchases a you know $50,000 a year car on average, you know, every 7 years. Well, we then model that in and we inflate it. So if it's $50,000 in today's dollars in 7 years, you know, I can't I don't can't do that math in my head, but maybe that's a $55,000 car 7 years later. And so we we add that expense in. Some people pay for them differently, so some people will take money out of an account and, and kind of tuck it away in a savings account so they can pay cash. Right now, with interest rates as low as they are, we have a lot of people financing them, so that makes it a little easier. But the way we plan for it is we build it into their budget. Same with roof repairs, home repairs. Um, we'll ask a client how old their house is, 
and what kind of major repairs they're expecting. The rough rule of thumb I've seen, you know, again, rules of thumb, but as you use 3% of your property tax value, so not the full value of your home, but if you look at your property tax statement and use 3% of that, that's about what you should budget for home repair costs. It works just as well to use, you know, at least 1% a year of your gross home value and kind of say you should be setting aside that amount each year for potential repair costs that might come up. Okay, and I'm, I'm sort of smiling on this one because we, we have had uh, team meetings where the, we've had some lively discussion about this topic. What kind of inflation rate do you use when estimating future medical expenses? Uh, typically 5%. Okay. So we yeah. use um, varying inflation rates on other things, but for medical, uh, we typically inflate all premiums and out-of-pocket at 5%. All right, and uh, the, the current last question, Dana, is how can you tell when you're getting into trouble and really need to change your financial situation in retirement? Uh, employment is unrealistic. That's a great question. Um, you know, the way we tell is by running a series of spreadsheets, you know, projections, like those expense timelines and income timeline that I showed you earlier. And we run those all the way out for someone's life. And, you know, do they have enough money? So we use a you know, very reasonable set of assumptions on what rate of return do we think investments we're going to grow at, what inflation rates, and, and we project that out. And if it doesn't meet certain ratios, then we will tell someone, you know, you're in trouble. And ideally, if we can spot that trouble and it's 20 or 25 years out, then small changes today can make sure that it doesn't become big trouble. Um, I tell this story sometimes, as, you know, I've only ever had one client truly run out of money and she retired and everything was fine. And then every year she took out substantially more than what we had projected. And right from the bat, I told her, you know, this isn't sustainable. You can take this extra money out once, but you know you can't keep taking this amount out. But she did, and in her case, it, it had to do with an adult child that she just felt like she needed to keep supporting. And so I would say, you know, if this keeps going in seven years, you'll be out of money, and then in six years, and and my projections were dead on. And unfortunately, um, you know, that's what happened. She spent it all, but she knew that's what she was doing. So it can be projected. And, and, you know, it can be pretty easy to quantify, like, here's what, what your spending needs to be to make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah, we'd like to say that nobody ever runs out of money by accident or surprise. We can, we can see it. Yeah, and in. I'll add, you know, we just um, scheduled the next webinar, which is going to be how to make a retirement income plan. That's going to be on Thursday, July to see what that Thursday is, I think July 23rd. And so I will be covering that testing process or a way of doing that testing on that particular webinar. Okay, we had a couple more questions come in, Dana. Uh, do you feel I-bonds are worth investing in for older retirees, say greater than 70, seeking inflation protection? So I like I-bonds on paper. <laughs> I like them a lot. I've just found them to be a very um, cumbersome, meaning, you know, you can't just easily, you can open an account online, but, you know, I had an iBound account, getting the money in and out of that thing, oh my goodness. And maybe that has improved over the years, but um, conceptually, yes, as a, as a, and you can only buy so much of them. I believe the cap is 5,000 a year per person. Does that sound right, Nancy? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I'll follow up if I've got that wrong. Um, because it's in my book. See, we write these things, and then years later, I'm like, yeah, I can't remember what the number is. But um, I believe there's a cap to how much you can put in them. If there wasn't a cap, I think, holy cow, it would yeah. be. But I'm pretty sure there's a cap, and so the amount of money you can get in them relative to most people's retirement savings is is not that great. Um, but overall, yeah, uh, on paper, I think they're an a great investment. Absolutely. Okay, and the the current last question is, how involved does Dana get in each new client plan? 
So that's a great question. It, it depends. Um, luckily, my wonderful planners like Nancy yeah. and uh, Chuck and Kathy uh, are able to put clients through the planning process and don't need my involvement. But if they have situations that do need my involvement, then I get involved at that point. But we all um, use the exact same planning process that I designed, and that has, I should say, now it feels more like the team designed it because I started it initially. And then, um, you know, everybody has contributed to it over the years. We all use the same planning process, uh, the exact same things that we cover at strategy meetings. There's a series of template reports that we created to make sure that we don't miss anything. We all look at the exact same types of ratios, um, all of the same strategies in terms of Roth conversions, fundedness, coverage ratios, all of the same same things. So um, whether it's me or someone else, and I will tell you, um, oftentimes I see things that my planners do, and I know many of our clients are even better hands than my own. I'm great at starting things, and they're great <laughs> at making sure they work just the way they're supposed to. <laughs> Another another last question here, Dana. Um, can you recommend the Ray Dalio All Weather Portfolio? Uh, I am not familiar with the specifics of that portfolio, so you know I know who Ray Dalio is, though. Uh, but I, I can't really comment. I don't know the specifics. I, my guess is it's some kind of a diversified portfolio. Okay. Um, that is that is all we have for questions as of right now. So if there are any last your final questions for, for the evening. Well, wonderful. I well, thank know. you, everybody. And uh, thank you, Nancy. Thanks for taking this Thursday evening out of your, your time with your family and, and other things that you could be doing and participating. And uh, we really appreciate it. Always a pleasure, Dana. Thank you. Have a great night, everybody.